<laughs> Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, put together a nice panel here of some of the quote unquote biggest names in security research space to talk about this whole notion of partial disclosure, full disclosure, what is disclosure, and just to get a handle on, on the debate. Um, just quickly, I'll start, let everyone give a quick one minute bio introduction of themselves, starting with Dan on the left. Well, my name's Dan Kaminsky. I'm the director of penetration testing for IOActive. I've been doing talks at cons for about the last decade. And last year, uh, the whole DNS thing went down and we ran 30 days where we told everyone that there was a big problem, gave them patches for it across a lot of platforms, didn't give them enough information to reproduce the flaw. So that's kind of my place in this whole game. My name is Alex Soderoff. Um, I work as an independent security consultant right now. Um, I think vulnerabilities are fun, and I will disagree with everything Dan says. <laughs> My name is Alex. Your hacking is awesome. <laughs> I'll be struggling to be heard amongst all of these guys for the entire two hours and 15 minutes. Uh, my name is Katie Masoris. I'm a senior security strategist with Microsoft. Um, I've been doing security for a uh, better part of a decade. Um, I've been a researcher, a vendor, a coordinator of vulnerabilities. I've founded vulnerability research programs at Symantec and at Microsoft, and I've uh, acted as the part of the vendor in uh, receiving vulnerability reports in both open and closed software, closed source software. My name is Dino Daisovi. Um, I'm a security researcher also, and been a pen tester, I've done time at, uh, at stake, some financial services companies, and I also like finding bugs and writing exploits. I'm Ivan Arce, I'm the CTO of Core Security Technologies, a company founded in 96. Uh, we've been doing penetration testing services and uh, software products for penetration testing uh, since then. I've also participated uh, since 96 in the finding, reporting, and disclosure of over 100 uh, security advisories. The first one of them being uh, one on predictable query ideas on DNS in 97. Ooh. Uh, let's start with Yvonne. What is partial disclosure? Because there's a, the, the definition is all, all, all up in the air. So, in, uh, and we can pr probably go around and jump in and not wait for me to ask questions. But if if you can start off with your definition of partial disclosure, does does it even exist? Uh, well, I don't think that that such a thing exists, uh, and we. Uh, we talked about that um, before, so that's the answer you wanted. No, <laughs> but, <that's laughs> but, uh, but it will be hard to put a definition on it. But I would say that it's... Um, uh, providing information about the vulnerability either to a subset of the uh, potential uh, population that is affected um, by it or can do something about it, or uh, a subset of the required information that is necessary to independently um, reproduce, find, reproduce, and fix the problem. That's, uh, I think that's the most accurate definition I can come up with. So a fraction of the information? A fraction of the information or a fraction of, uh, or to a fraction of the audience. Cool. So I, I don't think anyone argues too much about you find a vuln and you tell 20 or 30 customers as long as the vendors are involved too. I don't think that's the sort of partial disclosure we're really talking about here. Uh, the model of partial disclosure that I think is the most controversial is where you tell lots of people, hey, there's a problem. Maybe you give them a patch to do, maybe you don't. Maybe you give them actions to take, maybe you don't but you tell them there's a problem and you don't give them enough proof to actually validate for themselves that that problem actually exists. You might give them evidence, you know, look at all these other people who think there's a problem, but you don't actually give enough stuff for an engineer to validate the find. I think that's a fair definition. Dan, what went into your thinking? Just give me your mindset uh, in, in the DNS issue to go the partial disclosure route. Uh, in your mind, it was absolutely necessary at the time, mm -hmm. originally. Subsequently, said you wouldn't do it again. G give us a sense of what went into your thinking to go that route. Well, there, there are three things that it takes to take a bug from, there are th three things you have to do to protect people from a vulnerability. First, you gotta find the bug. You actually have to identify that something is wrong in the system. 
but that's not enough, so you found something. There has to be a fix. So the second thing that comes to mind is, okay, well, let's go ahead and work with Paul Vixie and get all the potential vendors involved in a room, get us all to agree, yeah, let's get a fix out. Let's even get the fix out on the same day. But there's a third thing that's required. Like, vendors are great and powerful, but they don't deploy the fixes. The people who deploy the fixes are the actual corporate IT administrators and ISP administrators who actually need to take that code and put it into a position where it can prevent my mom from being attacked. I can do all the magic in the world to generate a fix. Someone's got to actually get that code out. And I'd spent a bunch of time in corporate environments. I spent my entire career there. And I'm like, there's no way, even if people wanted to, even if the CEO insisted that this patch, because of where it was, could be deployed instantaneously. So I'm like, all right, I'll make you guys a deal, talking to the vendors. You guys get your patch out on the same day. And I will do what I can so that IT staff actually has at least some chance of doing the due diligence to find out where their servers were, because they didn't even know, to figure out when they could deploy the patch and get it into a place that it would protect customers. I knew that couldn't be instantaneously and instantaneous, and that's really what drove a lot of my actions. So Dan, uh, you've admitted that part of the problem is that uh, this infrastructure cannot be patched quickly enough uh, mm -hmm. and that processes were not in place to allow this to happen. Uh, and yet, your actions actually contributed to the problem because when you had an opportunity to teach people that this is important stuff that they need to take care of uh, if this kind of bug happens ever again, instead, uh, you gave them leeway. You uh, allowed them to go without patching for, what is it, 13 days? Actually, the initial, the initial period was uh, more like 30 days. So with this, it's, it's, it's like having a kid who's misbehaving, and instead of telling the kid, do not do this again, uh, perhaps punishing the kid and somehow, uh, instead, you're just letting the kid do whatever it wants, and as a result, the kid and also these corporate administrators learned that, well, when Dan finds a bug, we'll always have enough time, so we won't really have to uh, think about how to do patches more quickly. You know, I guess what it comes down to is I wasn't trying to teach corporate IT a lesson. I wasn't trying to beat them with the security stick. There was a problem, and frankly, most of the people that I spoke to were like, yeah, this DNS stuff actually really matters. We have to go fix it. We don't have the processes in place right now. We had, even with our best emergency processes, 30 days is a stretch. I'm like, yeah, it's better than zero, right? They're like, oh God, yes. And I mean, I think that's the real thing. Like, 30 days was hard. As an industry, as an IT community, we need to be able to patch our infrastructure with the sort of rapidity that we're able to patch our endpoints. But, you know, you, you have to walk before you run. You, you have to recognize that if you're very weak at doing something, it's gonna take some time to learn that process. And to the extent that I, as a bug finder, can assist people in creating non-crisis mode processes to deal with their infrastructure, I think that's a good thing. A big part of it was, you know, a big part of this is trust. Uh, trust uh, that Dan knows DNS. Uh, and what Dan is saying is accurate, and there was no peer review. There, well, there was an attempt at peer mm. review, where, which is where Dino came in. I mean, Dan briefed you ahead of telling everyone else so that you could uh, validate or a attempt to validate or help validate uh, what he had found. Are, are you pleased with your role in, in how that um, whole thing went down? Yes. <clears throat> so I was, and I was actually, you know, because I was very curious about the details of the vulnerability, so I was actually very honored that um, Dan, one, trusted me enough to um, keep the information private and, you know, let me in on it so I could, you know, help to say, okay, this is, a, is actually a big deal. Um, but one of the things I found is, you know, at the time I was director of security at a hedge fund and, you know, I found in, in the real world a lot of people, like, in security are just kind of preaching to the choir. And so we were just convincing more security people and they were each in their own organization still trying to fight the same fight of convincing the infrastructure people that this is a big deal. And, you know, I still had to you know, argue tooth and nail for us to get our servers patched. And like in a, re in a time frame less than two months, I was like, no, this is a big deal. And they're like, why? And I'm like, I can't tell you. 
And so basically, which is the problem? Which is a problem. And because um, you know, while we had you know some people who are technically savvy enough, they could say, you know, they had other people who kind of knew some details and they hinted at them. And like once they got the hint from like six different people who they considered in the know, then they're like, okay, I think this might be serious, even though I don't have the details. But it's a huge leap of faith yeah. for. Um, for you know, a lot of these infrastructure people to do this because if it goes wrong, I mean, you have to look at the risk from the, the risk calculation on their side. There's an unspecified vulnerability that has mostly specified consequences um, and that they should patch, but there's no clear and present danger. However, if that patch changes anything and breaks something, and most infrastructure is way more fragile than, um, than we'd like to believe. Um, that just changing the patch and changing the source port randomization, and then all of a sudden firewalls started breaking, and basically getting overloaded, and things just start you know tweaking out. Um, that breaks something now. That's a hundred percent certainty, and so they were unable to do do that proper risk calculation of them getting fired for breaking something without enough information about what the real um, danger was and seeing actual clear and present danger. But when a weaponized exploit made it into Metasploit, people were pretty clear that this was something serious. And in, in many respects, pain does help. Yeah. Um, Ivan, what is the value of exploits in, in, in scenarios like this? I think that um, I don't think of exploits as a tool to teach people a lesson and to force them to fix things. I think that uh, exploits are a valuable tool, like many other tools, to actually uh, protect things and figure out if your fixes are working properly. So. In this case, having uh, the Metasploit uh, exploit actually helped a lot of people to verify that their servers were, and, and not only the Metasploit exploit, but also Dan's uh, um, website that actually checked the query IDs of the DNS and DNS queries, um, to verify that the fix was actually working. Uh, and I wanna go back to one, one of the things that Dino said, which is that there wasn't sufficient information to determine if the fix, the patch should or should not be applied because the patch itself had side effects. In fact, installing a patch that randomizes source ports for the DNS makes uh, DNS punch holes in your firewall on every query and it opens up the firewall for attacks, particularly in, in UDP as DNS is, for attacks that spoof uh, packets that go back. So in, in our case, and, and, and I think that in many other cases, deploying the patch was also a risk. And lacking sufficient information to understand what the problem is and why that's the best patch strategy, uh, people were left in, in the dark. And I think that there's a lot of, uh, of uh, people that didn't deploy the, the fix rapidly because of that. So I think it's reasonable to consider there being two different populations of administrators out there. There's the population of administrators that's not going to deploy anything unless things are blowing up or at least they see an exploit in Metasploit. And there's a population of administrators who, well, they know me or they listen to their vendor or they watch actually every single vendor in the field do the same thing in the same time or they listen to the United States government Basically, there's a pretty serious population of people who are like, wow, the entire industry seems to be aligning to go ahead and deploy this patch. Let's deploy it. That second category is kind of something to encourage. It would be nice if we didn't have to go ahead and generate exploits for every single thing. If it could simply be, there's a vulnerability, there's a reasonable path to removing the vulnerability, go patch. You know. At the nth degree, not every bug should need to become a worm before we patch it. Simply knowing about the bug and having enough proof of that existence should be sufficient. So, I completely agree that you there were. Agree that currently it is not. There, it is absolutely the case that a large percentage of the people who ended up patching could not patch even if they wanted to within 24 hours. A large number of people did patch in the 13 days before the exploit came out, and most of the people who ended up actually patching at the end, the data suggests most of them took about 30 days. Like, How would you estimate the number of people who did not want to patch? So 
We know that we did have a spike around when Metasploit actually came out. We had a total spike in people who were like, oh, okay, this thing is actually weaponized in the field, let's go ahead and patch. Totally true, totally legitimate. I wish they had patched earlier. But you know, there were a bunch of people who did what we would have wanted them to do, who saw their vendor, who saw the industry saying, yes, this is something to deploy, and they did it. And I think that those people who are willing and able to take the advice of the entire industry, I think that's a great thing. So are we all up here with the same goal of trying to make this process go smoother next time, go better next time, protect more people next time? Is that, is that possible? Is that, is, that, is that a fair assumption um, on the part of you? Uh, yeah. Uh, but Alex, you, I believe, you believe that pain is good. Well, all right, so I do use the internet, and my mom uses the internet, just like Dan's mom. Um, and <laughs> my kids uh, someday will use the internet, and I would like them lot, to be okay. safer on the internet <laughs> than we are now. Uh, I also agree that um, causing some damage in the short term is better than having insecure systems in the long term. So perhaps my um, risk-benefit analysis is uh, slightly different from uh, Katie's or Dan's. Can you define so, damage? Hmm? Just define damage for me. Uh, causing a little bit of damage. What, how do you define that? Well, all right, I, th I think the best example for this are uh, the Microsoft worms that we had uh, back around 2003. Uh, if you look at them in retrospect, uh, even though they were pretty, uh, pretty damaging, they did not actually have any serious payload. If these types of attacks have happened today, we would see a lot more, um, a lot more code that steals credit cards, bank accounts, World of Warcraft accounts, um, installs, installs botnets. So I think the fact that these attacks happened uh, back then when they weren't as damaging because the uh, sort of criminal underground wasn't as well developed as it is now, uh, I think they served as a wake-up call and actually helped uh, Microsoft and some other vendors uh, take these things more seriously and make sure that these worms are much harder to do now than they were back in 2003, which is certainly true. Uh, I think so we'll all agree with that. So I think that uh, having some kind of pain um, in the short term, for example, breaking DNS now when not as many things rely on it as possibly would uh, in five years. Uh, I think this is better than doing nothing about it and having the same vulnerabilities discovered five years from now and actually uh, exploited for financial gain rather than just for fun. So, so you're talking about two different mm -hmm. You know, do two different populations, really. So you're talking about vendors, you know, um, my, my company included, um, and needing that wake-up call to be able to write more secure software. But you're also talking about infrastructure, so the deployers of this software. And the, the way that, that these two populations react to security threats is by necessity kind of different. Um, you know, so it may have taken uh, a lot of, you know, sort of serious wake-up calls for the general vendor population to start instituting, you know, programs such as the SDL to write more secure software over time. But in an infrastructure, you know, live deployment scenario, it's not as, it's not as simple to be able to build, you know, build these resili resilient systems that you're, that you're asking well, for to spring up, you know, overnight at this point because... Was it, was yes. it simple for uh, a large vendor to do that? It's, it's been an iterative it, process, but if you're, if you're looking at, you know, in deployment systems right now, that critical infrastructure, um, you know, that, that network of systems, you're looking at a much different problem than you're looking at a vendor overhauling its software development practices. Well, I, I, I think the problems are similar. In, in both cases, you have uh, some kind of organization that has some kind of established processes uh, that don't seem to be doing a very good job at remedying vulnerabilities, preventing vulnerabilities, or reacting to vulnerabilities. Um, and I, I do think that vendors have improved uh, in that respect. I think that infrastructure has probably improved a little bit too, but we do need to see a lot more improvement. So I'm, 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 not, sure what, I'm not sure why the thing that worked with the vendors would not work with the infrastructure people as well. We have a question in the back.
The question is what is, what is short term and what is the cap uh, on pain? Um, For well, you too. I'm not really the industry, um, so I, I find it kind of hard to um, really answer that question, but it will, there, there, there's certainly a certain threshold uh, and that once you reach it, doing something about the problem becomes more cost effective than not doing something. So once we reach that, I think the problem will go away. Well, if you just look at history, you kind of have an example. Well, how much pain did it take for Microsoft to start taking security seriously? We now know the answer. How much pain does it take for industry to start taking security, start taking like infrastructure security seriously? We don't know yet. So we got to keep amplifying a little bit. And one of the things I also want to point out from Dan's earlier discussion is we keep talking about the Metasploit exploit as being a weaponized. I think it's because we love saying the word weaponized. I mean, it's, it's just so damn sexy. Awesome. Um, but it wasn't. And actually, Dan pointed you pointed this out in your presentation. There's a lot of limitations that you said the Metasploit exploit doesn't work in the field. Well, no, the Metasploit host module doesn't look, work in the field. No, the the domain module works just fine. You said the Bailiwick one was not work one. No, 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 no. Bailiwick host, we're, we're geeking out. One of the modules doesn't work that well. The other one works fantastically. Okay. It just got away a little while. It, you, you, you asked the question about what is the appropriate amount of short-term pain. And I, I think that is an a inconvenient framing for the problem. Um, a better thing to say is, look, there are problems out there. And we know if we don't even look for them, if we put our head in the sand, that those problems are going to sit there forever. And the pain, when the bad guys use them, is just going to get higher and higher. I don't agree that there should be you know, a maximum amount of pain for people because they didn't do what security told them to do. That's just not my mindset. You know, we should have research. We should find out what's wrong with our networks. But we should really optimize for how do we fix the problem? How do we make it smooth and easy? As a security industry, we've just made it, not made it very easy to build good secure systems. That's not other companies' problems. That's not developers' problems. To a very serious degree, that's, that's our problem. It's too difficult and too expensive to take our advice. When, when we developed the patch and we got the synchronized patch out, that was not an easy thing to do. But we did it. And we got that done because we looked at the problem. We said, we, from the patch developer standpoint, we can at least get our patches out on the same day so that the people running Microsoft code aren't you know, laughing at the people running Bind, or the people running Bind aren't laughing at the people running you know, Cisco. You know, let's, let's get everyone out on the same day because that will make deployment easier. And you know what? The details of this are going to leak. There's no question. I don't know how many days we can get, but we can get some number of days. And whatever number of days, that's going to be another network and another network and another network that's safe. So we can help there too. I think that's a good thing. I think it is a, a great thing to, as much as possible, reward people who can, to the degree that is feasible in infrastructure, apply patches. I, I certainly don't think that we'd end up with a more secure internet if there was a DNS worm two days later. So I just don't think that. So. Uh I wanted to point in to point out something that you said earlier, uh, to which I don't agree, and I think that at the root of, of that uh, thought, it's many of the problems that we face with the partial disclosure uh, topic. Uh, you categorize uh, admins in two uh, groups: either those that are driven by fear and they only react when when the house is on fire, or those that are driven by recommendations from the security industry or from somebody, the, the government, an expert, somebody. I would like to think that there's a third, at least a third category, and I'm not thinking that it's, this, it's the only other one, but at least a third category, which is those that means that, that, and that people that li would like to manage the risk in a rational manner, using rational analysis and not just fear or recommendations from some guy. I think and that's I think to that's those reasonable. guys you need to give them the tools if you want to help them you need to give them the tools to let them make rational decisions. I Marcus agree. question and the quality of tools is driven by information. 
The quality exactly. of tools is driven by the, 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 the quality or quantity of information given. So exactly. How, so how not, do you? Not necessarily. Okay. I, I wouldn't say that it's it's driven by the level of information disclosure. I think it's it's mostly delivered uh, via trust because that was a big part of what mm -hmm. uh, what made your partial disclosure of the DNS vulnerability effective in the ways that it was, and it's partly driven in uh, I think you know per perhaps the need to establish a more common language. So. I'm guessing that you've probably never been in charge of a large infrastructure deployment. No. Right. So, and, and a lot of large infrastructure deployers have never been security researchers. Um, so there needs to be some sort of common language and, you know, just a lingua franca of being able to appropriately define the, the threat level um, in terms of, and, and, then, and then appropriately, you know, act upon it. So if it's agreed um, and, there's a, and there's a trust there um, between the two parties, uh, between the reporting party and and the you know the infrastructure uh, deployment party, um, then I think in the long run, even if we're in a position where infrastructure has gotten about as resilient as the most resilient software uh, company um, in the world for security, um, even if it has gotten to that point, there are still going to be security incidents to respond to in the future. There, there will be no perfect infrastructure in the future that is never going to need this kind of reporting and rapport back and forth between the security research community and the infrastructure that deploys the software that may, may be vulnerable. Right, but trust me, trust me isn't a rational way of managing risk at all. I mean, is that a rational way of managing risk in an environment? Uh, I think it is completely rational when your vendor says you need to deploy this patch. They're the people who you trust to have not put a rootkit into that server they shipped to you in the first place. So you're going to trust people. Which, which there, there's never no happened, question of that. Right? <laughs> vendor shipping rootkits ne have never um, happened. Never. 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 Right. Uh, I, I do want to actually say something really quickly because I think you hit on an important part. Uh, at least a portion of the people, and probably a significant portion of the people who patched once they saw Metasploit. You're absolutely right. They weren't yeah. responding to fear. Some were, but well, I think a lot were. It's not necessarily weren't. fear, though. It's information. Exactly. I, I, it's not real fear. I mean, I, if I have a Metasploit exploit that's, that's, that's showing me in a rational way in my environment that I'm, I'm at risk, that's real information. That's so not fear. I agree. Fear is saying, you're at risk. I'm not telling you why, but trust me. So, so what I'm saying is I certainly think that there is a substantial portion of administrators that if they're going to go ahead and take the risk to patch their environment, they want to see the vulnerability. But, you know, there's also a lot of administrators who can run faster than the bear or who need some extra time or who just want to be able to say, well, look, my vendor says it's a really bad problem and I don't need to know the actual vulnerability. I'm going to trust my vendor like I trusted my vendor not to ship me a rootkit root kit in the first place. And for those customers, for those IT administrators, I can make their life easier. Right, so th those are the, the ones that you cut are. The ones cool. who patched it before they saw the exploit had more time, more warning, more reliability, less need for crisis patch application. Okay. And to the degree that I can help those guys and make it so they're not there at three in the morning with, you know, stale pizza, uh, cool. So you are, you are trying to help those guys that are that make their decisions based on trust, not I'm, those that make their decisions based on a rational analysis of your finding. I'm, I think that's I'm okay. trying to help the people that's who realize in order to but do a security. you cannot secure, call that research. Let me, let me, you're right. This is bigger than just security okay. research. This is how we actually get mm -hmm. stable patches into the field. You want to talk rationality? Deploying an emergency patch across all the name servers in your infrastructure, which you don't even know where they are, and you've never actually had time to test it because you've waited all of those days, you are likely to cause the network to go down, and then you're likely to lose your job. So exactly. I'd like people not to go down the path of, oh, I finally see the exploit. Wow, this is really bad. Let me deploy an emergency fix and get fired. And instead, have 30 days to say, okay, there's a problem. We don't necessarily know what it's a patch for, but we know it's for something really bad. Let's run the patch into testing, see that the patch is reasonable, try it on a few machines, and actually get something that's not this chaos, emergency, oh my god, deployment, but something that is well tested. That idea. to me is rational. Mark.
Right. And IT security people should not go to their investigators and get permission to push it out. With real information. And monetary losses are the main thing executives care about. So more monetary losses, and it's more, the more they're going to trust their security people. Yeah, and also the so the DNS bug. We should you know try not to talk too much about this because, right. they, because it is there are somewhat, issues. There are other partial disclosure. There are other partial disclosure issues, and it is some, somewhat of a special case because basically this was something that kind of the first time that a lot of people had to um, really patch their DNS servers in a long time. I mean, there's kind of a lot of this was like a really big thing, and. What happens with, I, with I, like IT administrators is as they've gone through the process of things patching and, not, and things not exploding, they, get, they begin to trust it more. And so like for, you know, now, we don't need to see an exploit for every single like, Microsoft vulnerability to make sure it's real. You know, most, most, most organizations just say, you know, we're used to this cycle. We patch either monthly, quarterly, or semi-annually, whatever our policy is, and that's the ri we, we know our risk and we accept it. And if there's an extreme case, we'll break it. But infrastructure vulnerabilities often require more work than just flashing a patch across a ton of, you know, uh, machines. It requires maybe sometimes, you know, moving machines across the network, and they al also doesn't, ha doesn't happen all that often. You know, mo and it's much more than Microsoft in the network, too. I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but you have a whole lot of interoperability problems that um, potential, you know, potential things breaking with these kind of infrastructure patches. So that's, that's, I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of people are slow to deploy is because there was a huge, you know, downside risk to this of things exploding. So I wanted to get back to something that Katie mentioned, and I wanted her to uh, elaborate on it a little bit more. Uh, I think you said that um, there, there, there was a difference between vendors and uh, the way they would react to these vulnerabilities and get their patching processes uh, in order, and the infrastructure people uh, when reacting to vulnerabilities as well. And you now I, I, I do recognize that patching infrastructure is potentially more disruptive and more risky than just patching a normal server. Uh, but if you compare the work that a vendor has to do to produce the patch, uh, in terms of understanding the problem, QAing the patch, making sure it doesn't cause inter interoperability problems, and I'm sure that Microsoft has to deal with a lot of that when they make their patches, isn't that pretty much the same thing that infrastructure people have mm -hmm. to do when they need to patch a vulnerability as uh, well. Uh, Alex, um, there's however many dozen versions, a couple dozen versions of Windows that need to get patched by Microsoft every time they put out something. Cisco supports over 15,000 independent versions of iOS. 15,000. It's a totally, totally different universe of pain to deal with infrastructure than to deal with desktops. And that doesn't mean that infrastructure shouldn't get fixed. It does mean we have to recognize that it's an order of magnitude difference, like 15,000 versions. This is not a problem that Microsoft has. Well, and also, you know, you're, you're kind of talking about, you're talking about infrastructure at the macro level of sort of critical infrastructure, backbone type infrastructure. There's also the infrastructure that David Mortman was just talking about, which is in terms of the micro infrastructure of each individual organization that yes. has to deploy these updates. So what, you know, uh, in terms of getting, getting each individual organization empowered, you know, to, to be able to deploy these things in a reasonable time frame is a much different argument. If we as security people kind of, you know, go by the CIA triad of confidentiality, confidentiality uh, integrity, and availability as all being, you know, sort of equally important, roughly so, we're missing the part that the people who have to, who are responsible for keeping infrastructure going really only care about A. They only care about availability in a lot in a lot of cases, and that's the case where you know they're really balancing the the C and the I are sort of you know lowercase to them as opposed to the capital A, and that's maybe some place where the way that we speak to them we need to perhaps translate the effect of security vulnerabilities on their A. But so what I was asking Katie about was not actually uh, Cisco as a vendor 
having to build a patch for 15,000 uh, devices. I was talking about a, an organization that has some Cisco products and they need to patch them. That organization is not going to have 15,000 different Cisco routers. So the, the other right. thing to realize is patch management. I mean, we've been dealing with desktop vulnerabilities for much, much longer. Uh, infrastructure vulnerabilities really, really cropped up last year. We had, we had four major ones, mine, the SNMP v3 bug, the BGP stuff, which still has no fix in sight, and the, the WPA1 attacks. Our, our framework for dealing with infrastructure is so much less mature than our framework for dealing with desktops. And like Katie's saying, I think we need to be able to communicate respectfully to just how much less resources organizations have for dealing with their infrastructure. So I, I, even, one, one thing is to communicate respectfully, and a different thing is to make decisions for them. And, and regarding your, your point on the 15,000 uh, iOS versions, does that mean that uh, the risk is diversified in 15,000 rather than a handful of operating no, did, systems? Did you, did, you, uh, did you see FX's talk at CCC? So, yeah. So FX went ahead and said there might be 15,000 versions and here. And they're all equal, right? You know. They all weight the same, they all have the same value, they all have the same risk. Well, no, there's, there is, they're all just as hard to fix because of testing, but they have a unique chunk in them that can be jumped to for exploitation. So you have this great situation where, no, it's still 15,000 versions of pain on the defensive side, but from the offensive side, you can take this little bootloader chunk and exploit them all at once. I mean, that was the big takeaway from FX's talk, that no, you can't consider yourself more secure just because of all these different versions. They're all iOS, they all have something in common. I mean, it was a tremendous talk. Well, I'm sure this is exactly what people said about patching 100,000 endpoints uh, back in the day, but now patching 100,000 endpoints is certainly possible and people do it. Um, and this happened because there were enough vulnerabilities and enough exploits released uh, to make it important. So I think I, I would like to ask I, my co-panelists. Or just a lack of options. Hmm? Or just a lack of options. All right. So, yeah. so what happens? What happens in your scenario where uh, the infrastructure to be updated um, is embedded systems driving around in people's cars? Is there a massive automotive industry recall while chips are ripped out of you know thousands of cars? I mean, this is the type of issue that you know it can be that difficult. It can actually be that difficult. I, I realize that it is difficult now, but if you're a car company and you're building these types of systems, you have to recognize that in okay. another 10 years okay. or 20 years, you're going to have to patch them every single day. Okay, what if they're pacemakers have zero and, they, days. And, the, and thousands of surgeries need to be performed, you know? Go on. Well, Go on. then you need a different update mechanism than a surgery. All right, so software is becoming more and more pervasive. Uh, you know, we didn't have to worry about patching cars. Uh, no, no, like, you know, in the 80s, you didn't have to worry about having your car patched. 
But today, you're starting to see this, and in the future, it's just going to accelerate more and more. So we are going to have to patch all these systems, cars, pacemakers, uh, internet-enabled glasses. Uh, so we are going to have to patch them eventually. So I would like uh, these vendors and these companies to start working on this now before it becomes critical. Because my prediction is, now I, I would prefer this not to happen because I would like to live in a safer world, but my prediction is that you know, the car companies and the pacemaker companies and you know, medical devices companies, all these, other, all these other organizations are just not going to care about it until it's 2020 and people are getting their pacemakers DDoS remotely. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to realize that, oh shit, we actually should have built something better back in 2009. I think, Probably, go ahead. I think I really don't understand what's this. Uh, I think everybody is overly fixated on patches, as if patching is worse or were the only way to fix a security problem. And, and I think that that fixation on patches uh, is based on the fact that people would like to uh, have the risk go away, disappear, the bug disappear. And, and Many people, it's uncomfortable living with imperfect things like software. So uh, the moment we start thinking that software is imperfect and we will have to live with bugs, we will think about solving security problems with other means, not just patches. Patches are good, patches are great, but there's other means to solve things. Mitigation uh, of risk can come in many flavors. And going back to the partial disclosure debate, because that was Yes, topic, please. Right? And, and <laughs> I, would, cars. I, I really like the analogies of, of millions of different things, like uh, people uh, trying windows and door knobs to trigger bugler alarms and, and port scanning and so on. Uh, but the, the topic was uh, partial disclosure. So if we accept that mitigation is a valid strategy, then we need to open up our uh, information to other potential, let's say, Helpers, not just the vendor, but other people, other uh, practitioners that may uh, solve a problem to uh, reduce risk rather than just the official one. I just wanted to add a quick point to counter um, your you know, economic argument about how much do the car companies pay for a secure update mechanism? Um, a mere fraction of anything else they pay money for. How many security engineers does it take to design a secure update mechanism, and how much does that cost compared to the cost of one flight on a, uh, on a you know, private jet? <laughs> That's, that is nowhere near the scope of their problems. It's chump change. You know, it's, it's, but the it's first funny, time they get a big recall. It's funny you mention that though. actually, because so so my girlfriend runs a web design firm, and she basically said, you know, I'd love to go ahead and ship secure websites, but I kind of looked into it, and security professionals want more money to find out if the site was secure than I got for actually building the site in the first place. I mean, we're talking a greater than 100% increase. So. Don't think security is not cheap. It actually does cost money. It, it can cost a substantial amount of money. It, it depends on the actual product and the scope of things. I mean, you know, for a, we're getting on. <laughs> I, I, um, I did want to say. I mean, it's interesting. We're talking about pacemakers and car crashes. You know, you went in and got your car patched. <laughs> I bet you didn't say, "I want to see video of a car blowing up in flames." <laughs> <laughs> If there's a pacemaker that needs to get patched, it's like, I ain't letting you touch my pacemaker unless you kill that guy right there. With <laughs> exactly. And the determination oh. of how much pain is enough pain, that's not something that I think, you know, should really reside in the hands of a single researcher with, you know, yeah. uh, a, I think so. you know a nuclear weaponized uh, vulnerability. Right? And recalls cost a lot of money, which goes back to Adam's point. They'll start investing in update mechanisms when it starts to hurt the bottom line, which comes back to Alex saying pain is good. And information Nothing hurts sales like people dying oh. in cars. <laughs> <laughs> so I, was, I was not arguing that security researchers uh, are the ones who set 
the level of pain and how much pain is uh, enough. Um, what I was saying is that, like, the, the market ultimately determines these things. Uh, I guess market and regulation, but we don't really have security regulation, so it is left to the market. So when the cost of not doing things, not, not taking care of security is greater than the loss, the losses of, uh, that, that arise from these vulnerabilities, then the uh, vendors and infrastructure people and all these other, uh, all these other people who need to do, take action are going to take that action. So uh, I believe that as security researchers, our job right now should be to increase this cost uh, in the short term to get these things fixed before they start being, before these systems start being used in more critical uh, ways. Well, I mean, to some degree, we are the less expensive option, right? I mean, I would much rather an exploit be found by you than be found by some kid in Romania. I mean, that's, that's the, the bottom line truth. Like, security research is truly all about, let's take something that would be really painful and expensive, a bug being found in the field and exploited, Adobe's spending a ton of money right now dealing with the PDF bug. You know, let's take that and instead let's have a more well-ordered, planned execution of a fix. I mean, that's what security research is about. It's about we're not some kids in Romania dropping Bulgaria. exploits and causing Adobe to spend a bunch of money. We're, <laughs> we are still finding the problems. We're still identifying them. We're still disclosing them, but we're doing it in a way that is as painless as possible while still achieving the goals of creating a secure infrastructure. So here's a, hypo here's a hypothetical, uh, or an alternate history, if you will. So in uh, 1988, the Morris worm appeared, and it showed that, yes, you can exploit buffer overflows, you can take over the entire internet with a worm. Um, like conceptually, it was not any different from the worms that we had in 2003. The only differences were in implementation uh, and also the size of the internet, the number of affected machines. It was a little bigger. A, a little bigger, yes. Um, so I think that the reason we had to deal with this problem in 2003 was because nobody paid attention to it in 1988. And this was probably because there wasn't too much security research uh, in buffer overflows in writing exploits. We didn't really see uh, another public buffer overflow exploit until, what is it, 92, Six. five? No, the Thomas Lepatic exploit, I think. Oh. There, yeah. was, there was, there was, there was enough stuff. research on buffer overflows. It was just not public. It was in the uh, multi security evaluation of 1974. That was a US force document. Right, but it wasn't public, but there, there was, was enough. There was a lull in the, uh, that's L-U-L. Uh, the availability <laughs> of exploits <laughs> and the, 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 the damage caused by buffer overflow exploits between 88 and I guess late 90s. Um, and I think this was time lost. If security researchers uh, had been producing exploits in 89, 90, 91, 92, uh, and these problems, like we would be, we would have gotten these problems out of our system by the mid to late 90s, instead of having to deal with them in 2003 uh, and so afterwards. I, Which I, is good that they can, we got them out of our system in 2006. <laughs> right. Right. Well, except on my, on the other. What you're talking yeah. about, which is that we don't learn from history. We forget. Uh, yes, because it's, so because it's, well, because the 88 worm, all right, so, so the comment was, we don't learn from history. And I, I, I do agree that we don't learn from history very well. I mean, human beings never do. But, but we do. I what, mean, what the we the do. worm era is largely over. Hmm? Because of 2003, the, the, the era of the worm is more or less dead. Yeah, but except, that's, except not really, that's not really history. The Morris worm was history. We learned from, uh, we learned from pervasive right. attacks that cause a lot of problems. Uh, and when you see them every couple of months, like we did with the worms in 2003. I think the, the reason the Morris worm was sort of forgotten is because it wasn't repeated. Like, I'm really glad that because the economic impact of it was fairly limited because the economic size of the entire internet was pr 
pretty minimal in 88. Yes, but, but if, 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 it was follow, if it was followed by worms, you know, every couple of months throughout the early 90s, I'm pretty sure that um, all, of these, all of these companies that enthusiastically embraced the internet in the 90s would have had second thoughts and uh, would, have dis would have demanded something more secure with a somehow better well, architecture. I'm not, he, I don't know what well, the better architecture would even be. With what, the, what the people, summer of worms. Pe people demand infrastructure that works. Like, that works, that stays up, that is available. Like, I cannot emphasize enough how much availability actually matters in the real world. Um, the 88 thing, you're absolutely right. It was not followed up with a sequence of, you know, worms every couple of months. And so it did get forgotten. 2003 happened. Operating systems are way more secure. But, you know, the worms of 2003, what did we have in the infrastructure realm? We That's, had Mike Lynn okay. in 2005. And we talk about worms like they're, like, you know, ancient history. And it's like, okay, the Morris worm was a hybrid worm that did a buffer overflow and cracked passwords. We have not seen one of those in, I don't know, a month. <laughs> <laughs> Con Hello. But There's it, one going on right now. What are you talking about? I'm talking about worms that are like 2003. They're still... Two, you know, in like, two, like well, sure, well hang, hang on. In 2003, the summer of worms, computing didn't work, right? Like, you went to a trade show in 2003, and all the computers were down. If you were a security guy, you were running around, not selling product. You were just fixing your competitors, because if you didn't, all of the people would leave the trade show. That was my summer of 2003. That sucked. Configure went, was you, not that. You went to a wrong... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, seriously, like, we had a worm a month ago, but the level of systemic disruption that that, that configure caused is not even on the same order of magnitude, and that's a sign of success. We learned stuff. I said that I was going to disagree with everything Dan said, but I actually agree with this. So, the, so, so let, me, let me go back to some of Dan's points, just to provide a counterpoint now that you are agreeing with him. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you mentioned something about finding it's better than I find a bug than some kid in Romania or Bulgaria or, or some other country. And no offense to Romania or Bulgaria. All right, yeah, but, the, but, the, but that's a false uh, dichotomy. I, I mean, the, the chances that you find a bug and nobody else found it at the same time or before you are very slim. The chances of that happening repeatedly over time with several findings has been proven. Infinitis infinitesimal, right? So, <laughs> so you should so assume that whatever you find, somebody else found it. So format string vulnerabilities before uh, around circuit 2000 or so, that was, that was infinitesimal? Because nobody was looking for them. They were there. They were there since the epoch began. What are you began, talking about? Right? Um, who was it? So who, uh, was it Tesso? So they had like, you know, a Wu uh, FTP, FTP debug, a format string for like a decade <laughs> before people were talking about format strings. Before yeah, we, but what was the, you said? What before is the year? economic like, like, before like Newsham's like t format strings paper? Like I think there's some web to be debug that like I think Tesso or some group like said, oh yeah, we've had this for like four years, four or five years, and it's been present in Woof to BD for a decade. Like they've known about it for a while, and they're like, oh, this is good. We're not telling anyone about what this. Is, is that a fair assumption that, what that it, the I, bug it, you found, you have to assume someone else find, I found total, it? I, I would be shocked, given that all of DNS's security, you know, as what it was from 99 on, was based on a technology that was, uh, there were 15 ways around the TTL. I'm not the first person ever to have found that. What's key is this. It's what is the economic impact of some guy somewhere figuring it out and sitting on it. And the reality is there is no economic impact. There's very minimal economic impact for what's in the TESO archives, what's in the ADM archives. And you know, if, if the reality is that they can come back and say, oh, we've known about that for a decade, that's nice. You didn't get it fixed. So hey, everyone else, you did nothing to prevent someone else from being exposed to it. But what if somebody's quietly exploiting it and you don't know about it? There's always going to be quiet exploits. I mean, that's, that's the reality of things. This bug was on a scale that there might have been 100 quiet exploiters, 1,000 quiet exploiters. I don't think I was the first person to find my DNS bug. I wanted to be the last, though. And that required getting DNS poisoning isn't all that quiet. Uh, oh, it can be real quiet. <laughs> oh, it can be incredibly quiet and subtle. That was the other so, fun thing, so realizing you, how... Uh, it can be incredibly quiet so as for you not to notice that somebody else is 
exploiting yeah. it, right? Yeah, you go ahead and you poison like the domain that provides a static JavaScript file for you know some major website. So you're not actually poisoning Facebook directly. You're poisoning the domain for a 30-second period that happens to provide JavaScript, and now you're in the JavaScript DOM. I mean, so, there are ridiculously subtle attacks that could have been going on forever. So therefore, therefore, you should assume that just because you cannot find an incident that you can point at, that doesn't mean that the incident doesn't, no incidents exist. And you should assume also that somebody else may have found the same bug and may be using it for mm -hmm. other purposes than saving the planet. But you know about bug so, dumping, yeah. right? I mean, like a patch comes out and it's like, well, this, this you know, my, my fully done exploit, this is the end of the line, so might as go well go do a bunch of exploits as much as possible. Like, or, oh, that's the neat new thing, let's go ahead and write an exploit for it before the patches are applied because I know in the real world patches take time to apply. Look, I, I think we're having kind of a disclosure discussion in right. general and I don't think anyone here argues that we should go back to the days if they ever were there where bugs weren't disclosed. Bugs should be disclosed with enough technical information so that independent engineers can reproduce the bugs. Otherwise the potential for fraud is too high. But what Everyone stops? agrees on that. The only question is should there maybe be a little time for people to apply the actually, patch? I we don't so. actually know that. The thing is, right now, just, just to play devil's advocate, right now we live in an internet full of, like, you know, cyber, you know with cybercrime, with fraud, and with the current disclosure practices. We have not had an internet with fraud without a current disclosure practice. So we don't have any point of comparison. Basically, they, you know, evolved um, essentially par in parallel. And the causation argument is impossible to know. So where do we go from here as an industry? Just to bring the conversation back on top. Go ahead, Marcus. I was going to say, if you're, if you're going to throw assumptions around, it's really interesting because you're, you're actually engaging in a circular assumption. The assumption is that there's an infinity of bugs. <laughs> and that if there's an infinity of bugs, they will continue to be found and continue to be disclosed, so you will have an infinity of fun. Okay? That's the problem. What needs to be done is not to say, let's figure out how to build a better bug finding and tracking economy, because the entire premise of the bug finding and tracking economy is that it's going to make software better. You look at the last 15 years of software evolution and the internet, and you can actually see it's getting worse. So if the premise is that what you're doing is helping, it's obviously refuted by a simple observation of the facts. We need a plan B, and your approach is not it. Well, so, not exactly. There isn't actually an infinite source of bugs because people are writing more and more code. The number of bugs is proportional to the lines of code, and there's more code being written today than there was five years ago. Therefore, there will be more bugs. And, and you're assuming two other things. One, that, and, and I think, oh, Alex said this, uh, but finding bugs is just fun. That's one of the things that you said. The second one is that software development and security has not improved in the, 15, in the past 15 years. And that's, I think, not a fact. In fact, I'm pretty sure that somebody on this table may <laughs> have something to say about that, <laughs> right? Absolutely. I mean, it, certainly, um, you know, our software has, has had measurable improvements um, even over the past five years you know, at Microsoft. And so I don't think it's fair to just, you know, say that, that software as a whole hasn't improved. Um, that's not, that's just not true of every single vendor. It's more, I think it's more a reflection of how little we know, relatively speaking, right? Format screens, they're what, they're like eight years old, something like that, right? Also, lots of software, sorry. Um, I think, uh, I think the fact that software is looking worse these days is because there's a bunch wider variety of vulnerabilities that we now know exist that we were not necessarily looking for five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And there is also the inexorable move towards additional software, the additional lines of code, these new technologies that sort of get created without any consideration for security. So in, in a sense, it is a lot worse but um, uh, but with with software that's been developed with you know some notion of secure programming principles, if you just think in terms of the amount of uh, human labor that it would take to break into a major vendor's software product, it's not going to be five minutes anymore in comparison with ten years ago, fifteen years ago. 
just to get it back on topic, where does the industry go from here uh, in terms of getting around this, this notion of, okay, so trust is not a, a, a rational risk management approach. Uh, peer review might be done. Uh, at the end of your, your thing, you were, you, know, you were talking about maybe oh. a council of peer review where, the, and again, the media has been left out of this entire discussion. Uh, a council of peer review to have the media report properly on security issues, because a lot of this, a lot of this stuff, is driven by bad headlines or poor headlines, well, I, or the I, internet is dying. Headlines. Is there is there a way to 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 productionize trust? Sorry, I'm interrupting. I'm over no. here. <laughs> so, uh, to David's point before, like you you said, where does the industry go from here? The key point everybody keeps batting around is this problem of trust. Like that seems to be what partial disclosure rests on, right? How do we like this problem of trust and who do we trust? So is there a way to operationalize the concept of trust? Is there well, a way to develop like a, a I, standards body or a framework or some group whose job it is to say, right, exactly. I listen to these guys and they, they seem like they know what they're talking right. about. Some sort of, so Patrick, we need, I did to answer Ryan's leading question. Yes, we do need basically some sort of peer review because one of the things that happens with security researchers is your first, every bug you find is your baby. Yes. It is the most Correct. serious bug that has ever happened, <laughs> and it is completely blown out of proportion in your own mind. That's regardless. Any, any bug finder knows this. And then you talk and to the media, and that gets amplified Unless you're marked more. out. Huh? Yeah. Unless you're marked out, mm -hmm. then you just don't so, care. He, he's dulled to that <laughs> sensation by, by now. I mean, when you're a cyborg from the future that can you know, find the, has a, to, a new bug and send mail in 2006. He has to cut himself when he audits just to uh, see if he can <laughs> just feel. feel something. So, so I think to answer your question, I think that uh, there are some things that can be done to, uh, to make the trust uh, a more viable uh, approach. But before that, Givan, is there any scenario in your mind where partial disclosure is necessary and helpful? It's necessary for what? I think every, everything for that we do is partial. We don't provide ex er, all the details um, to the ultimate bit at the same time to everybody. Right. right. So there's, there's a degree of, uh, of disclosure that over time uh, becomes uh, more relaxed. Uh, the audience uh, becomes wider and the level of details becomes m uh, more precise. However, I believe that to um, reinforce this idea of trust, what needs to happen is uh, to have a transparent process. Because you cannot achieve trust if you meet with five guys in a room to decide what you're going to do, and nobody else knows what actually happened in that room and when that discussion uh, took place, and what was exactly the discussion, who said what, when. So how do you to make the whole that? process more transparent will help a lot towards building trust. And transparent is what? Sharing that information with not five people, but 10? So what happens to the other 10? At so some point, there's. Transparent so is sharing the information who, whoever needs or wants to look at it and may have a decision to make based on that. So I, I, I want to get back to something that got said earlier about peer review and so on. Like, the biggest mistake I made when I came out with a DNS bug is that I didn't have any other hackers on board with me. That, you know, when I was asked straight out two days later, hey dude, like, what's this bug you're talking to everyone about? I said to, you know, someone respected in our community, no, I can't tell you. And it caused all sorts of pain and you know, finally led into me getting Dino and should have had that on day one. Um, this is not a problem of who do you trust, because people trust their vendors. It's a problem of, it's a huge ask to ask people to violate their change control procedures. It's a huge ask to ask people, please patch your infrastructure with an emergency patch, even for 30 days. It's like we're telling people, please jump off a cliff. They're like, what? No. And they said, no, 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 it's okay. There'll be water down there. People usually survive cliff diving. It's kind of a fun thing. It's enjoyable. It's cool. You know, gravity. And like, you know, the IT admins are like, no. <laughs> And you know, that was really the scenario I was looking at. It was like, I have this big scary ask for people and they're just gonna reject it because the risk is so much higher. 
So I, I think framing the problem around, well, how do we get people to believe us that it's really important to apply the patch? It's, it's the wrong way to think about it. It's how do we as an industry make the long-term changes so that infrastructure isn't so risky to patch? And this to some degree requires fundamental changes in hardware, requires the ability to integrate infrastructure into patch management, requires hardware that rolls back when a failed firmware image is installed, requires dealing with the fact that configuration files don't actually work from one version to another, maybe involves there not being 15,000 versions. So, I mean, that's, these are engineering problems. We keep blaming the business guys and saying it's business realities. We're just not being very good engineers here. That's the bottom line. I think, I think we can all agree that disclosure could be better than it currently is, that there are still things that we haven't sorted out about what's the best way to disclose vulnerabilities. And I think maybe we might be able to take a lesson from some other form of disclosure that's maybe been around longer that ha seems to work better. Let's go back to the idea of automobiles. Recalls, people are very motivated to take advantage of recall programs. Is there anything that we could possibly learn from that? Is there, you know, some way that some positive reinforcement that we can use to motivate people to patch rather than a negative reinforcement? Pain. Well, well we people, people are, people are uh, very willing to do recalls because people die yeah. if you don't do recalls. Uh, you know, you have all these pictures of like cars exploding but and you don't want this to happen to you. Over vulnerabilities. What? People lose, uh, but people, I mean, people don't always die over recalls. Sometimes they just get burned. And sometimes people <laughs> lose their job. <laughs> well, oh, that's, I, that's, I, what I'm saying is that people sometimes lose their jobs over vulnerabilities. So why isn't there the same response? You know, and, and can, we, can we take anything from that? I don't think people lose their jobs over vulnerabilities uh, enough for, for that to work. Like, if, if you know, I'm a sysadmin and the server gets popped with, with an exploit, I'm probably not going to get fired uh, because exploits happen to everybody. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's not forget that we didn't always take the people dying in cars seriously either. We went back and forth <laughs> when the cars were blowing up. They actually did an ROI and said, hmm, it'll cost less to pay for the insurance than it will to pay for the ladders to put in the cars and make the dog explode. You know? So I think we're dealing with some of that here too. To, to a degree, I mean, people dying is special. Like, people dying is special from the perspective of for 5,000 years, when one guy dies, the rest of the family goes up to the person who's responsible for it and beats the crap out of them. I mean, you know, this is a human, human thing that happens. I mean, you can even see it in animals. There really do seem to be two kinds of, two kinds of human creativity. You have um, people die, so that's anything manufactured has product liability attached to it because people die. You know, this cup can kill me, this thing can kill me, this iPhone can kill me. And so there's product liability attached to it. And then there's the Hollywood buddy movie, which might be terrible, might be awful, might waste two hours of my life, but it's not gonna kill me. And so there's no product liability attached to it. Software actually lives in the scale of, of, uh, of Hollywood movies. You know, it may be good, it may be terrible, but you're probably not gonna die. There are a few exceptions, but the reality is more people have been killed by windows crashing on them than by windows crashing. So, <laughs> Dan, <laughs> the, the, the <laughs> so, clearly, so, so clearly we, windows we have this situation. Let me, let me finish this out. So we have this situation where, you know, there's no product liability attached because the consequences of failure don't involve dead bodies. You know, there's a you know, minimal corpse count here. <laughs> but, um, and the, the issue is, is that it, it is really computing is the first realm where you don't have dead bodies, but you do have widespread economic damage. And so this new third category in the middle, we don't know how to deal with it. We know we probably don't want to do product liability though, because I mean, there are database products that'll go unnamed that I'm not sure what decade they could ship in if we had product liability for security vulnerabilities. It wouldn't be this one. It wouldn't be the next one either. It'd be, you know, 2023, you can have your financial database back up. So I mean, that's the reality of things. We've been very productive and innovative without a product liability regime. If we were to insert one, it would get messy. And so the best we have to deal with now are security researchers providing some kind of information to the market 
these are the solutions that are secure, and these are the solutions that will blow up in your face. So, uh, so I, I completely Dan. agree, Dan, that we need to have better engineering, both in terms of like the software development as well as the deployment of our infrastructure. But as much as I hate to say it, we're an industry, IT, that is perhaps one of the most egotistical industries on the planet. And security You don't people, know any uh, surgeons, do you? <laughs> I said one of. <laughs> okay, thank you. The, the medical industry is another. Um, <laughs> and within that industry, much like surgeons within the medical industry, security people are some of the biggest asshats around, myself included. <laughs> um, and if we want to have trust with, our, with the business to convince them we know what's right, we occasionally have to admit that we don't know what's going on and that we don't know the right answer. Yeah. So and as opposed to going, the correct answer is to ban this or to do this right now because the, answer, the fact is we don't know. But, no, the, but the, there's a problem, a, a similar problem to that is what I call going native. When the security person uh, identifies too much with the like IT teams, like what's painful for them, they go native and they're, there's too com they're too compassionate and they're like, well, you're right, this isn't too much of an issue. I know you, you enjoy your weekend. It's, it, nothing will happen. And then something does. And it's the, on them too. I mean, you have to maintain that some level of independence so that, you know, we're, while you're not completely on the side of being a total asshat that no one wants to work with, but that you're not, that you actually can um, reliably and accurately portray the, the uh, risk of an issue. So, you know, while there is, while there is always that risk of going native, I suppose, um, I, think, I think it is valuable to have, you know, sort of cross group uh, professionals in our industry people who have been responsible for large infrastructure deployments and people who, and, and that availability, maintaining that availability, and perhaps their bonus structure was tied to how many, you know, how many hours of uptime their infrastructure had, you know, to give them a real incentive. And they also, you know, should be security people who overlap with those types of people. So, I mean, you can, you know, you could say that it dilutes one or the other, but I would actually say that it probably will strengthen the position of both sides to have more of those cross-group people. So, Jack. The security professionals that are trying to fix things, the researchers, um, we're talking about the business people, and I'd kind of like to come back to the other person at the dance, which is uh, the vendor's reaction to bug disclosure in the past has kind of gotten us where we are, where there are people who have reported things um, some companies are getting better, some are getting worse. There's the ego issue of my bug is the worst in the world. But there's a party. Um, I've got a long history in the automotive industry. and I can, There were no seat belts until people died and somebody made them. And some manufacturers like Volvo then realized, I'm going to make a safe car. And it's a selling point. And so the other person at the dance here is the vendor and how they've reacted. And there are various people that are in this room that have you know, gone through things and know. So we kind of have to address how the vendors respond to this. And it, I don't want to put Katie on the spot because of yes, where she is. No, I don't. Because <laughs> actually, as much as fun as it is to make fun of Microsoft, everybody here has to do the, the Microsoft bit, right? The, oh, uh, Microsoft sucks. It's so insecure. They've gotten so much better, and they're so much better than everybody else uh, <laughs> under our breath. But, you know. A little louder, please. I need it for my ringtone. <laughs> well. <laughs> That's as loud as it gets. But you, you know what I mean, because I mean, you live this, but I just want to bring it back to the vendors. If the vendors hadn't gotten us to this point where NHTSA had to say, put a seat belt in there, we'd, uh, we wouldn't be there. And so some vendors, you know, and I don't, they all react differently, so it's not an easy answer either. That doesn't give us an answer. But I just want to point out that there's somebody else at the party. Right. The vendors have a role in this whole partial disclosure debate as well. How much information are they willing to share during an attack, uh, what kind of mitigation they can offer ahead of a patch, and what kind of information they share back and forth with bug finders, and all that stuff. There's, a, there's, a, there's another group in this party, I totally agree. But where do we go from here? How do we fix this information? What, what level of information needs to be shared? Let, let, me, just, let me just ask a question, that one. What, what do you guys think on the panel of you know, the uh, SourceFire VRT team putting information out about the Adobe security issue? You know, I mean, we know that the number of trusted groups defined whatever a trusted group is has been working on it for like two months trying to fix it. And then Adobe, you know, the SourceFire guys actually come up with a patch with enough details to give the guide buyers even more of a chance to come up with kits to exploit it. You know, what's your view on that? You know, is that moving back five, ten years? Or is that partial disclosure? Is that okay or not? You know, 
And you know, if you look at it from a trust point of view, was Sophia not part of the right trust group? You know, to be in the loop. I think Adobe taking uh, two months, maybe more, to uh, patch this uh, vulnerability when it was known that it was actually in the wild and the bad guys were actively using it. I think this is moving back five years. Uh, you know, in 2009, you should have a better reaction time than multiple months on a public zero day. Not I, so much the I patching, think, but even to offer some sort of guidance. I, I disagree. I think that is 2009, not just <laughs> Adobe, but every other vendor does exactly the same. And in with a few specific cases in which that doesn't happen. But the norm is two months. It's uh, at the least two months. talk yesterday was, uh, yeah, there's a two month test process that goes into every patch. At least. in. Two months, and that is if they get it right in the first shot. If yeah, not, there's another two months to wait for it, and usually it's three, six months. <laughs> so that, and that's, that's not norm. for that's not for zero days. I mean, certainly we've seen Microsoft react uh, more quickly than that yeah. in some cases. At extraordinary and expense. I mean, the, there is a exponential cost to putting out a fix to an O day. I mean. Fixing bugs is a little harder than opening up a hex editor and changing a few bytes around. Like, you can do that, and it'll maybe work for one little variant of the attack, but the reality is, is that engineering quality, I mean, people want things that work. People want, want Acrobat to work. And one of the funniest things I remembered hearing after the Acrobat volume was, well, why does, why does Acrobat need to have JavaScript anyway? You know, it's like, you know, I'll run no script on a website. Why does the web need JavaScript anyway? Well, because that's functionality that people need in order to get their jobs done. It's not security for security's sake. It, security is necessary, but it's not the point. Actually, you're, 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 you're wrong about the hex editor thing, but we can talk about this later. Um, <laughs> you know what? The, the, I, I, the, I want, I, I, you know, the, raise your hand if you want to have patches that are comprehensive well tested and do not impact functionality versus who knows what it does uh, we modified why, in a hex why, is, why are all your options binary either the software is secure or it blows in your face either you have patches that are completely tested reliable or you have nothing there's the real there. world is analog not binary uh, things are more <laughs> quantized it, than you think either you tested it enough or uh, you didn't so, <laughs> so the problem goes back to like so how we set up our infrastructure for instance okay we know that there are vulnerabilities in software. We know that a number of these vulnerabilities are exploitable. We know a number of these vulnerabilities will be exploited. And yet, still, one client-side bug ruins our day. I mean, d doesn't that kind of point to the larger problem that basically we are really getting in a tizzy because someone can send you like a PDF and all of a sudden all the sensitive information in your organization is leaking out to who knows who? The fragility because of, of our one system. vulnerability? Uh, yes. That's, I mean, the, that's the thing that we need to, that's the hard plumbing to actually rewire is that we assume that, you know, everyone needs to have access to the most sensitive documents in the organization on the same computer that they, you know, surf the web with and answer their email and do all this other things. Like, no other, except for in like an information technology, no one else does this. Banks have vaults. They put all their, all their important things, you know, they limit access to it and they put people far behind. Like the way that we still build our networks allows, you know, you, you should, to compromise an organization's like, um, you know, deepest secrets, you should have to use at least six vulnerabilities, not just one. And, and banks don't usually tell you that, oh, securing your money is really hard and we have all these, these difficulties, so therefore, uh, well, we're going to see if in six months we're going to put a vault, yeah. right? So that's, and I usually don't like analogies, but going back to, to Dan's comment on the complexity of testing uh, patches and deploying or shipping patches, uh, yes, that's actually a, a real problem. But I didn't pick the uh, engineering process that my vendors are using. I already financed that in, in engineering process, and if they pick an engineering process that makes them uh, that makes it really hard to fix their own bugs, then why should I pay again for fixing it? You know, it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's an absolutely great point that 
if you want to have security as something that you deliver, it needs to be a, a first class citizen in your, in your development model. And really, until about 2003, I don't think the rest of computing outside of, you know, us guys who like breaking stuff, like, I don't think the rest of computing got that if they were going to do what we wanted, they were going to have to change their processes. I mean, it's not the performance development life cycle. It's not the reliability development life cycle. It's, you know, the secure development life cycle. And that level of, wow, we can do everything right. We can get all of our features in. We can have perfect performance. And still, when we ship it, customers are going to scream and shout, oh my god, it's missing this check. You know, and I want this feature in here, not in your next version, not in your next service pack, not next week. I want to fix now. I mean, this is new. From an engineering perspective, demanding fixes on rapidly accelerated timelines is, is something that is, is difficult, not impossible, but something that does require investment and process in order to, to establish. Figuring out how to develop and modify and evolve development practices so that bugs can be fixed on a reasonable time scale when it comes in responsibly so that it can be fixed on an unreasonable time scale when it's dropped by a kid in Romania. I mean, th these are hard problems, but we should recognize them as engineering challenges. Okay, the, the vendor would like to speak here about the difficulties <laughs> of issuing vendor updates. Um, so there was actually a great talk yesterday morning by some of my compatriots in the audience, um, you know, here from the MSRC um, ops and engineering teams. I and they strongly recommend you get those slides and watch that talk when it's watch, available yeah, on watch, video. Watch the it's talk. Really it's good look into what Microsoft does. Again, I would like a chance here. So, um, <laughs> so, so the thing is, um, the way that I look at it and the way that I've looked at it from before, you know, I, I worked at my current employer is as a security person, you know, what are we doing? We're finding vulnerabilities. We're breaking stuff, right? So um, when we report them to a vendor, um, we'd like them to fix the broken stuff. If in that process of issuing a fix for the broken stuff, they break more stuff, that's not really serving the purpose, right? So, I mean, that, that's, that's really the core of the matter. It, there, there has to be some quality assurance processes that does happen to take time. The bigger the footprint of your deployed, you know, uh, uh, vendor footprint, the longer it's going to take. The more app compat testing you have to do, the longer it's going to take. The breadth of your products, the depth of your products, that, that's all determining factors. So it's not, you know, that um, it's not that you don't have an engineering process that is so bloated that you can't, you know, that you can't fix things quickly. It's that you have a breadth and depth of products and you have a responsibility to your customers to not introduce worse scenarios for them by issuing your uh, update um, before you properly tested it. So, but yes, it's not that you have a, a software engineering process that cannot fix uh, things quickly. Uh, you have an engineering process that can fix things within two months. And some other vendors can fix things with, within four months or per quarter, and some others within a week, right? Uh, some vendors issue fixes for the specific bug that was reported to them. Some vendors cluster <laughs> hundreds of fixes on the same patch and then need to test the entire patch on the entire uh, platforms that they support. The choice of which vendor does what and which uh, engineering processes are followed are not made by the customers. They are made by the vendor. And the customer I disagree pays 100%. for that choice. I disagree 100%. As the customer, the vendors do what I demand because I demand it and this person demands it and this person demands it. And that's why Oracle does more security. It's why Microsoft does more security because we said we're not buying that shit. And it turns out that Oracle customers wanted their patches quarterly. Microsoft want them monthly. It used to be that Microsoft patches came out weekly, and too many people said that's too much. And the, getting back to trust, I happily deploy Microsoft patches within hours of them showing up because I can, Microsoft has established that I can trust them that they're going to work. Every single and they time do. they're and they going do. to work. And I, when I did this, you know, with tens of thousands of machines every month at my last job because I knew I was willing to take the risk that there was an off chance it might break something and I would rather break something in the way that I understood it than waiting for the next big bug, to, the next big um, worm or whatever to come out. But the fact of the matter is if I knew that Microsoft was pushing it out 
after eight hours of testing as opposed to a couple of days of testing or whatever it was, I wouldn't trust them as much and I would wait longer and I would do more testing on my side. So mm -hmm. if you want us to trust you as researchers and as vendors, I would much rather wait an extra couple of weeks and know it was right the first time. But would you make that decision on behalf of every other customer like you? That's, we that's do it as we, we as an industry, as customers, have made that demand. We have said, make the patches right or we'll go somewhere else. All I will right. spend money with your competitor because your patches suck. But would you like me to make that decision for you or for somebody else in the audience? As a, as a security researcher, no. That's why I went to Microsoft and said, as a fix software it, vendor, or I yes. will go to someone else. As a security researcher, it or sounds like he wants no, it his way and not as yours. As a software vendor, yes. Yes. <laughs> what I'm telling other, you right? is, as the person spending the money, mm -hmm. I have gone to my vendors and said, this is what I want and you will make it so, or I will find someone else to give my money to. Right, and that's a financial, inve a, a, a financial incentive. It's the only incentive there is. But, if, but, but Ivan's point is right. I mean, the only way you make proper decisions is based on information, based on good, hard, quantifiable uh, metrics, numbers, information. And the only way to measure real risk, again, coming back to the whole partial disclosure thing, is how much information is enough. Is partial enough? And I, we gotta wrap up, I think Katie's got a flight. And the <laughs> camera, the, 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 the recording has run out already. So just go down, up and down the table. Dan, what's a perfect world, disclosure wise? <laughs> <laughs> wow. No, I, I have a plane to catch. What are you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm lax. Everyone, what, what is a perfect world in your mind? And are we ever going to get there? We have two problems driving the industry right now, I think. Two real core issues. One of the problems is we don't know how to get authentication working between nodes. That we might have some ways of fixing. The other one is we don't really know how to write secure code, and when we screw up, we don't really know how to fix it unless we do you know, the, the Windows update approach. How we fix those two problems, I don't think is a you know, shake our fists at the business guys problem. Perfect world is a lot more investment in, in operational infrastructure, in patching infrastructure, in development life cycles, in just really getting part of the conversation being, yeah, this is a, this is a feature that actually matters, and by the way, there are ways that people are going to measure you and potentially direct their money in one way versus another based on how security is done. Not just how performance is, not just how reliability is, but also how security is and have that be on real world actual metrics as opposed to you know, what got in the press the other day. I think that's the, the, the perfect world. Alex. All right, so um, in my perfect world, vulnerabilities, actually this is, this happens in this world too. Um, usually, uh, there, there, there is a curve, and vendors and customers uh, are at the point of the curve that corresponds to the now time. Uh, attacks and potential attacks are in the future. Uh, if you only do your risk analysis uh, based on the attacks that are currently being exploited, and the vulnerabilities that are currently known, uh, that people currently know how to exploit, uh, then you might do fine for you know, today, 2009. But if you don't think about what are the attacks going to be in 10 years uh, and start working on remedying these attacks, because the remedy might take 10 years, uh, redoing your entire uh, engineering or software development process might take quite a long time. So if you start doing this when the attacks are actually a fact, this means that your customers uh, are going to be exposed to it for a number of years because bef until you have the um, capacity to uh, deal with them. So I wish people did risk analysis um, by paying more attention to what is coming in the future using the current attacks just as a guide for what could be possible, but multiply them by a factor of 10. Um, in, that uh, in, in that perfect world, we might have uh, actual security, but I don't think this will happen. Katie disagrees. Wow, that's so, such a sunny view of the perfect world. <laughs> um, so, 
you know, obviously we're, we're in a place where, um, you know, engineering practices uh, are being refined um, across the board. Um, at Microsoft and at other vendors, um, we have a secure development life cycle that we use to help, um, help us build more secure software from the ground up. Um, perhaps what we need, you know, uh, to extend this to infrastructure and deployment organizations is something more along the lines of a secure development and deployment life cycle, or bring the D all the way up to a full double D. Um, perhaps, you know, it's, it's a little bit difficult to uh, <laughs> convey, um, <laughs> you know, what, what an ideal world would look like because Honestly, you know, we still have, we're still at odds, you know, as an industry. The people who find vulnerabilities and the people who are responsible for maintaining systems, you know, are, are still not seeing eye to eye. And I would like to see, you know, a lot more overlap, a lot more collaboration, and yeah, a lot more trust building between, um, between the people who say the sky is falling and the people, you know, to whom the sky will fall upon. So um, that would be my, you know, sort of ideal world. Is there an ideal world, do you know? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, ironically, th so I've, it's taken me a decade, but I've finally come to agree with Marcus Ranu, who has now left. Um, <laughs> he, I thought you waited for him to leave to say this. No. Uh, um, like basically the penetrate and patch cycle, I actually, I'm starting to believe is kind of a, a distraction. That basically it re the fact that, so if, I, if someone were to just post a really you know, serious IEO day, full exploit, weaponized, 100% reliable to the net right now. Um, in, a, in the ideal world, that really wouldn't matter very much because we'd have enough exploit mitigations, we'd have you know, segmented networks and enough other barriers that um, would make that not be as serious as it is today. You know, someone saying, I found a bigger rock with which I can throw through thicker windows, um, th that wouldn't be a big deal. And that's what I consider the, you know, the ideal world where um, we have more intrusion, like, you know, more defense systems that actually work and more intelligence on how to build networks that one O day does not ruin your day. But it's an arms race. I mean, Mark Dowd is going to get up at Black Hat and cut through all those defenses and yeah, research Mark Dowd, kind of But it should take Mark Dowd ten, 10 bugs to compromise my organization, not one. Ivan gets the last word. Oh, sorry, and diversity. He should have 10 bugs in 10 different products of 10 different technology sets to compromise my organization, not just one. So I don't think there is a perfect world. So it's, it's a bit naive to think about the perfect world in security. I think there isn't going to be a perfect world ever. We need to uh, grow up and assume that we will deal with imperfect software and hardware, and we will deal with security that it's not complete. Uh, I also think that it's, it's easy to go, and I disagree with Dino agreeing with Marcus. <laughs> uh, it's easy to <laughs> it's easy to to give up and say, "Oh, penetrate and patch doesn't work. We should look for a revol revolutionary change that will make all things uh, great and and, and we will write the software right from the start." That's not going to happen. Uh, security will improve from my perspective on more like an evolutionary manner. And we will get incremental, incrementally better over time. It's gonna, how much it costs and how fast it's gonna be depends on how we deal with the problems that we find. I think that in order to make that faster, the pace faster, and to reduce the cost, uh, we need to provide more information, more technical details, provide them in a transparent manner and help people make decisions by themselves and not have the arrogance of making decisions for everybody else. Uh, lastly, I also think that we also tend to think that researchers, vendors, customers, security practitioners, they are like separate uh, groups and in fact they're not. They're always in the same mix. Uh, we do research, we also uh, build software and we are also customers of several, several vendors. And I think we're not unique in, in that aspect. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Thank you, Dino. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Dan. Thanks to everyone. That was, it was Thank great. You.